we're here with the baseball playground. We're here with probably the most polarizing, most fun college baseball player that you could ever watch. Rock Reggio. Thank you for being here today, Rock. Yeah, no, thank you guys for having me. It's honored. Blessed to be on here. I mean, it's going to be fun. Let's get after it. Absolutely. It's going to be a blast. So we started this podcast to kind of give kids that don't typically have, you know, the the type of early success, young success you had growing up, uh, being a Team USA member, you know, being in perfect game, area codes, you know, some of the people might not even know what that is. Right. So, um, you know, we just wanted to, you know, bring guys on like you to, to talk about, you know, your experiences, um, you know, kind of what what drives you, what your routines are, um, how to benefit younger players or kids that maybe don't have the opportunities that you have. Um, you know, you've been successful everywhere you've been, you know. I remember when you were 13 years old, you know, you're winning pony championships. <laughs> um, you know, high school, you take an undefeated or a one-loss team. I, I don't remember. Yeah, 20, 29 and one. Yeah, 29 Who's and counting? one. Yeah, Insane. Right, yeah. Right. You guys are. Um, 29 <laughs> yeah. and one. You guys win CIF. You know, you're declared one of the best teams to probably ever play, right, as, right. as a group in, in your division. Um, now you go to Oklahoma State. You have a, you know, slow start. Um, to your standards, I would say, mm-hmm. in the beginning of the year. But now you, you know, at the end of the year, I mean, you're everywhere. You're, right. you're all over. Um, teams don't want to pitch to you. Teams don't want to face you. And, and you do, uh, you know, took uh, college baseball by storm. So we appreciate you being here. And No, thank you. Thank and, you. And just love to hear your thoughts on um, just your process, right? Like, how do you, how does a kid who wants to, to go to Oklahoma State or or any uh, college baseball uh, school where where should they start what should they do what separates people yeah I mean for me it always comes back to the reason why I'm playing you know I mean in college and when you're playing travel ball and you're playing with the upper echelon group of people you tend to press and you tend to be like see people say oh there's a scout here I gotta play for the scout oh so and so is watching me you don't know who's watching me I gotta play for, for them because they're watching me I need to get drafted I need to go to college and all this and all that and I kind of sh- go back to the reason why I'm playing, which is when I was 10, 11 years old, I'd go to the baseball field to get the churro after the game, or I'd go to the field to get the snack bag. You know, I was doing it because I love to do it, and I love to play. And for me, the second I start losing sight of the love for the game and loving to be with my friends and being with people who also love the game, that's when I started, you know, not playing as good. And I started pressing, and I started – thinking too much and overthinking and then my swing wasn't perfect so I got to change something up and so for me I mean really is just loving the game every single day and remembering like it's all fun man if you don't love it then why are you doing it so rock obviously um the regional against uh Arkansas was the coming out parade for you yeah um I got to hear why the Jack Sparrow the story behind the Jack Sparrow what pissed them off so much about the Jack Sparrow? I think yeah. it's a fantastic movie. I don't know why anyone would be upset great about it. Great movie. Johnny yeah. Depp, great. You, you inspired me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, so, I mean, I was just, I was binge watching the series. Like, I was just binge watching Pirates of the Caribbean. I loved it. I was messing around at practice, you know, doing the whole run going on. And then they're like, you got to do that in the game. And I'm like, no, nah, like, I can't do that. Like, I just can't. I don't, I, like, I don't have the sack to do that yet. I can't, I can't do the run. And I was at, like, six or seven home runs. I hit a home run in the Big 12. And, like, I see someone running and doing the spare on the dugout. I'm like, no, I can't do it. Like, I can't do it. And then the regional comes around. And I hit that bomb against Arkansas. And I'm rounding third. And I see someone in the dugout running like Jack Sparrow. So at this point, leading up to practice, they were all calling me Jackie Sparrow. They were calling me Rocky Sparrow. My coach was calling me Little Jackie, like Little Jackie Sparrow. So I'm like, man, like, this is, like – they're giving me an image, man. They're giving me an image. I got to do it. So I hit the home run, and then I'm running around third, and I hit the Jack Sparrow, whatever. It goes, go, goes viral. It goes crazy. Who cares? So that was just, like, all for the boys. And then the very next day we play Arkansas, and that's when I sprinted around the bases and was like, come on, let, let, let's go. Like, let me hear you guys. So that's funny because I was getting hate on the internet for doing the Jack Sparrow, and it was all for the boys, like, for my team. Like, it wasn't to, like, disrespect anyone else. It was all, like, for the guys. And then that was kind of premeditated. But the next day, I sprinted around the bases, 
And on the internet, they're like, oh, like he jogs slow around the bases. Now he's sprinting around the bases. Totally not premeditated. So I hit a ball out, dead center. Center fielder's going back. He jumps up for it. His glove goes over the fence, and the ball comes back. And I'm like, oh, man, like, holy crap, he just robbed my home run, brought the ball back. But I didn't, re- I didn't realize it was over the fence. I'm sprinting. I hit second. I look up, and I see the third base umpire going like this. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, like, why would I slow down? Like, I'm already here. And so I'm rounding third. I'm like, bring it on. I'm like, here we come. Let's ride. And then, like, it got, it got crazy. But Jack Sparrow was for the boys. The sprint was not premeditated. It was all love. It was all fun, man. It was fun. How often do do you – do other teams misconce- have a misconception of of some of the things you guys do? I mean, you guys hit home runs right. clearly out of the freaking stadium. Yeah. So, like, like teams get upset about that? Or are they just I think, like, yeah. oh, man, you hit the ball too far. Like, I'm pissed off about no, it. No, you know? I think the misconceptions come from the fan bases. Like, other teams' fan bases, like, oh, like, so-and-so did this. Like, we're canceling them. But really, like, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're talking to, like, other baseball players, like when a guy's on second base and I'm like asking, I'm trying to get to know him, like see where he's from and tell him he had a gorgeous swing. Like the guys you play against, everyone knows the things you do are not to disrespect the other team. It's all for the team you're playing for. It's all for the boys. So like when we played Arkansas, like they were a damn good team and they had some really, really awesome dudes on that team, just some stand-up guys. And they know that nothing I did was disrespect them and nothing they did was disrespect us. It was all just energy in the moment emotion because we love doing what we do if you're playing at division one you gotta love playing division one if you don't love it you're not gonna hang and so i mean there's no disrespect to other teams and you know when someone's disrespecting you and they knew i wasn't disrespecting them Jalen battles hit a pump the homer out of the out of the bark it was yeah it was, it was actually it was actually pretty cool um but he pimped it and like we didn't care you know we were pimping home runs they're pimping home runs it was fun like Griffin Dorshing pimps a home run. Noel McLean pimps a home run. Rock Reggio pimps a home run. So-and-so pimps a home run. So-and-so sprint around the bases. So it's like, it's all fun. I mean, it's a game that we love, the baseball players love, and it's a game for the fans to be entertained by. 100%. And I and think that's so, what separates pro and, and college baseball. Like, yeah. college baseball is so much fun because of the, you're allowed to have a personality. Yeah. You know, you're allowed to, you know, yeah, there's unwritten rules and things like that because that's all through baseball, but you're allowed to be you. Yeah. And, and I think that that's what, made at least last year's regional probably the most fun bunch of games I've, I've watched. So, yeah. Um, yeah. If you, if you ask me, it was the greatest regional of all time. Even though we didn't win, <laughs> I thought we should have won. Yeah. But, man, it was fun. It, it was, was a fun. Blast. A, lot of, a lot of bombs, that's for sure. A lot of bombs. I think, like, I mean, because it was us, Arkansas, Missouri State, and GCU. And I think combined we hit, like, 50-something home runs. And then, like, one game when we played Missouri State, we scored, like, 50 something runs in one game. I was like, dude, it, we did, we did some crazy stuff in that regional. You're a unique, you're a unique um baseball player in the sense that you know, you have full scholarship. You have you have people that um you know, love to be around you as teammates and love to to coach you as coaches. Um how does a how does a player if you can, you know, from an early age, is it, is it reps? Is it, is it, what's, what's the separator? Is it strength? Is it reps? I mean, you were probably one of the most highly touted 14 year olds going into high school, mm-hmm. um, in the area. So yeah. what separated you from that, you know, 12, 13, 11, 12, 13, 14 year old years into a high school, you know, what thousand Oaks that, that just ended up being, you know, so dominant you, Max Muncie, right. um, and so many others. Yeah, I mean, you look at um, me and some other guys who are very successful, and it's really just doing that one extra thing that's going to put you ahead of the guy in front of you. And for, for me, what that looked like was I'd go to practice, and I'd practice for the two hours. We'd take round balls, we'd hit and do whatever that was. And after, I'd go home and hit in the cage for another two hours. And so I knew by me doing the extra work after practice, it was putting me ahead of at least one person. It was making me better at my craft, and it was putting me in a better spot to better myself for the future. And that has taken me on to, to college. And even when I've been playing at Oklahoma State, we have our long practices, we have our, our BP, our inner squads, six hours, seven hours a day. And I just feel like I didn't get enough that day. I feel like I didn't do enough. And so me and Marcus Brown, Aiden Mule, a couple of my buddies at school would 
We'd go back to the field that night, and we'd take some more swings. We'd take some more ground balls. We'd do some glove work. We'd do some fielding work. We'd do some drill work. And so for me to specifically answer your question, it was doing the extra things to put me ahead of other people. I mean, for me as a baseball player, I've always been on the smaller side. I've always been 5'7", 5'8", not super strong, not super big, not te- definitely not tall. And so I needed something that was going to put me ahead of other people. And part of that was the chip on my shoulder was that I was small. That what kept me that kept me going. I was playing to prove that it doesn't matter how big you are, it doesn't matter how short you are. All it matters is about how you play the game, how hard you play the game, what you're doing and why you're doing it. And for me it was that chip was I was short, so I gotta do a little bit more than other people. And so the extra reps and prioritizing the things I knew I needed to work on with my glove, with my bat, with my path, whatever it was. Those were the things that put me ahead and put me in a good spot for my future. Was there something that you did entirely differently from high school? You know, you're like you just said, you're smaller. Some of the guys you're playing with are, you know, well over six feet tall, Mm -hmm. over 200 pounds, and they're just mashing baseballs. But you're over here on the shorter end of things and you're doing the exact same thing where you're being in a competitive mindset and in a competitive way uh, competing with all of these bigger dudes than you. How does that work in your head where I feel like you're way more of a dog right. than a lot of other people on the baseball field? So how can someone almost be more of a dog in their own mind where they say, like, I do not care, and I'm just going to attack this next next pitch. I'm going to attack this ground ball, and I'm going to go forward with the best effort. Yeah, I mean, you, you kind of answered it in your own question. It's attacking that next mm-hmm. pitch, you know, and having that dog mindset to where, the game is personal. When you're in the box, it's personal. It's me versus the pitcher. It's you versus me. I don't want you to beat me. I'm beating you. When you get a ground ball, oh, you hit the ball to me, you're out. If you hit the ball anywhere near me, I'm making a diving play, and you're out. And so it's just having that it's personal mindset, you know? Like, if I want to do this as a long-term career, there's going to be more people rooting against me than rooting for me. And you kind of got to gotta know that. I mean, you have to know that, that whatever you do is what you do. You know, like you're taking the game into your own hands. You are, no one can do it for you. No one can do the extra reps for you. You can't hit the ball for me. You can't throw the ball for me. So I have to perfect my game, you know? And then once it comes game time, I want to let people see how good I've gotten. I want to let people see that I'm working on turn on an inside fastball. And so having that chip on your shoulder, having that mindset of it's personal, you're not beating me, I'm going to beat you every damn time, which realistically, you're three for 10. You're not being the dude every time. Right. But having that mindset of you can't beat me, I'm going to beat you, that's kind of been the factor that's put me ahead, a step ahead of a few of the, the bigger guys. I mean, you, you have some bigger guys who are freak athletes and what they do is crazy, but their whole entire life, that's what they have leaned back on. They lean back on their strength, their size, their skill set. But for me, I had to lean back on I'm a short guy, I'm a dirt bag, I'm going to slide in a second and take you out. And that was kind of how I've gone about things. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, when, when discussing size, because I feel like that, that is a huge chip. That was a yeah. chip for me, that was a, that's a chip for you. Um, I feel like anyone under six foot, you know, the quote-unquote scouts or, you know, these rankings that come out, you know, for these high school kids is, oh, well, He's not big enough. He's not strong enough. He's not He's not this or he's not that. There's so many negatives that go against somebody who's shorter. What would you say to those rank? I mean, I think they're BS. Hmm. I, I mean, I think it's 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 the heart of the player. It's right. the dog in him, right. you know? And, and once you, you let that chain off off that guy, like, he, you're either a baseball player or you're not. Right. And I feel like we, as a society, get so caught up into these rankings whether you go to this camp and I paid for this camp, so I'm now I'm ranked or or things like that. Do, do you buy into that? What what are your what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, you look at rankings and like you said, some of it's BS. Um, you look at people who you play with. You know, you look at like I played with Jacob. Jacob and I played ball together. We knew I knew how good he was. He knew how good I was. You play with some of the really good baseball players and amongst each other, amongst baseball players, you know who is who, you know who's a dog, you know who's going to get in your face, and you also know who's going to get hit by the pitch and go to the ground and cry, you know, so you you know that as baseball players, I mean, it's hard to ignore 
scouts. It's hard to ignore perfect game rankings, the PBR rankings, and all the other ranking systems. And I'm not the one to want to knock on those and say, oh, they're, it's all BS. But there, I feel like, is some politics co- is involved with that. Um, but at the end of the day, like, the people you play with and play against, they know how good you are. They know, they know what kind of person you are when you play. And so I think it's, for me, just remembering, like, I'm a dog, you know? Like, who cares what they're saying? Like, I'm going to make my own path, and I'm not going to let a ranking dictate whether. I mean, you look at... You look at the mock drafts, you know, done by whatever ranking system. They're wrong every single year. And they're like 20, 30 picks off. Like, they're not even close. And so, I mean, take away what you want to take away from it. But overall, like, the people you play with, they know what kind of player you are. Absolutely. And, and I'm, not, I, I, I'm not dogging the, the rankings per se. You know, you know, I think Perfect Game does a great job, especially with their setup when you go down to, like, San right. Diego and, yeah. and play and – and PBR, I feel, does it does it does it does a good job. Um, there might not be some people agree with things and 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 so forth, but as far as just like, I think you hit the nail on the head. The rankings shouldn't matter to you internally, right? As a baseball player, like great you're ranked or great you're not ranked. But you know, the last I checked, rankings only go up to what twenty five kids, thirty kids, fifty kids, whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, there's a lot more of those kids that aren't ranked that play college baseball than there are that are ranked, oh, yeah. right? So mm-hmm. that's my thing is I feel like so many kids get caught up with I'm not ranked, I'm not signed, I'm a junior, I, oh my god, I'm I'm a I'm a sophomore, I'm not signed, or I'm a senior, I'm not signed. Does that, you know, you played with a lot of guys, you were fortunate enough to be be signed at a or or at least committed at a very early age. Do you see? Do you think that that's a good mentality to have? Bad mentality? What do you think? can help these kids understand that this is a business and, and this is a process. And just because you're not ranked as a sophomore or junior right. or, or you're not committed as sophomore or junior, don't worry. You have time. Yeah. I, p- part of it is you have time. Another part of it is like the mindset we talked about earlier. How are you going to take the ranking and how are you going to let it affect you? For me, I was ranked anywhere from the first player in the country to 150 in the country. When I was ranked 150, in my mind, I'm thinking, you know what, I'm going to show these scouts why I'm number one. Like I'm going to go out there and I'm going to be the best to prove them wrong. Like I'm going to go out there and do what I do because I know I'm better than a 150 ranking. So, yeah, you think about it. You're going to think about it. Subconsciously, you're going to think about it because everyone wants to be have that social media platform to where, okay, like I'm, I'm the man, like I'm the dog. But at the end of the day, like, you look at Nick York, who got drafted in the first round, who wasn't even on anyone's ranking board. He went, He was like, I don't know exactly what pick, but he was in the top 15 picks, and he was a first rounder. Kid wasn't even ranked. So you look at a lot of these guys who, I mean, you look at Tom Brady, who got drafted late in the draft, and now he's one of the, the best football players to ever play. And so the rankings, again, I don't think they're always right, and they're never going to be always right. But there's always going to be those people – in the baseball community who can see you, the college coaches, the professional scouts who are like, okay, this kid's kid's a baseball player. And so, yeah, it's hard not to get caught up in the rankings. I mean, I, I got caught up with the rankings when I was younger. But then, like, I had to remember, like, man, I'm not playing to prove uh, to a scout who's never played baseball before that I'm good. You know, I'm playing because I love this game. And that's what I do. Absolutely. I'm thinking along the lines of just that you were committed, you had all this talent that was built up, and you were also – committed to UCLA at one point. And I want to talk about that actual character development within you going from UCLA to Oklahoma and how that actually shifted your mindset at a young age, you were signed and you were like, all right, let's, let's go, you know, verbal commitment. And you were about to make a jump to UCLA. Right. And then you realized that this probably wasn't the spot for me. Run me through that process. Yeah. I mean, so for me, I committed um, to UCLA eighth grade. I didn't even know what high school I was going to yet. And I already mm-hmm. committed to college. And so UCLA was an early commitment. UCLA is an amazing school academically. Awesome. The baseball team, John Savage, Bryant Ward, they do a great job over there with their boys. They run a different kind of program. You know, they run a small ball, really good pitching school, not a very friendly hitters park, but they do, they're, they're good at what they do. They're good mm-hmm. in the Pac-12. They're good at what they do. As I kind of got older, as I got older, um, I started maturing. Um, I started coming, growing into more of a man, less of a boy, and realizing that you know I kind of just want to go somewhere where I'm. I'm gonna play ball. I'm gonna hit homers. 
I'm going to run around the bases. I'm going to occasionally pimp a home run. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to play with some freedom. You know, I kind of want to go somewhere to where I get 10,000 fans at a game. Like, I want to play in a fun environment to where everyone loves baseball and they love who they're playing for. They love their coaches. And they just love the environment. They love the college town. They love everything about it. And so for me, it had nothing to do with UCLA. It had nothing to do with the team, the program, the environment. I mean, a little bit environment, but nothing to do with actual UCLA itself. It had to do with more of what I wanted. For instance, I wanted, I realized that I wanted a baseball field on campus. I realized that I wanted 10,000 fans at a game. You know, I realized that I wanted to hit a bunch of home runs. I realized that I wanted to play good infield. I wanted to develop into a, a better baseball player, but when I came to the game time, just to go ball out and play. So as I matured and realized what I want, I came to the decision that UCLA was not the right fit for me, um, per se. My uncle played for John Savage in Nevada, Reno, and had nothing but good things to say about John. And I just realized, you know, like, UCLA is not for me. You know, I kind of want to go ball out in a place where I can get some crowd. You know, I can, I can, I can make some loud noises here. And so I got older, realized that I kind of wanted to get away from home a little bit. You know, I, I have a big family. I have seven siblings, six siblings. I'm one of seven. Love my family. Um, kind of want to be on my own. You know, I kind of wanted to be in my own little safe spot to where there's no distractions. Um, I could do nothing but work on myself and focus on baseball. So I took my visit to Oklahoma State and instantly fell in love with it. Ended up taking a couple more visits after that. And in the back of my head, I knew that Oklahoma State was that place that I so desired for growing up. You made the right call, right? I yeah, mean, that's, love that it. That stadium holds what, fifty thousand? Yeah, right baseball stadium. Man, we got thirteen thousand at one of our games last year. A bunch of standing room. We got corrals in the back to where all the fraternities and sororities go and mm -hmm. get loud and rip their shirts off and they're throwing beer in the air. And so it's it's a good environment. Yeah, it's an amazing environment, amazing place <clears throat> to play. You're in a great conference, which which also helps. Take me through that. Take me through a day to day like Division One athlete what what does a division one athlete have to do on a day-to-day -day basis yeah in season out of season you tell me you know what's the day-to-day -day grind yeah i mean first things first is you gotta just prepare yourself you know you gotta get into a good routine a routine for me looks a little bit like this i have class at two classes a day class at 10 uh, and i have a class at eleven thirty, and so i wake up every morning around eight stretch a little bit go through a breathing routine and then I, we have breakfast. We have a, um, it's called the, uh, man, what's our breakfast hall called? Anyways, we get, we get team, we get team breakfast paid for. And so breakfast is from seven to 10. I go to breakfast at nine 30, walk to class after that, uh, go to class at 10 after class, I go get lunch and then I go to the academic center, knock out some homework and then go to my second class at 1130 or it's either 1130 or 1230. Either way, it's in that time period, that hour period. And then I go to the second class, go pick up some more food. Normally, I grab a smoothie from Tropical Smoothie right down from our field. Best way to go. And then I go to the field. Practice roughly starts around 2.33 for us. I get there around 1. Um, I get in the hot tubs, get in the cold tubs, stretch, roll out, go see the trainer, have him roll me out, have him rub me out, work on shoulder mobility, hip mobility, kind of just get my body ready for practice that day, um, go through practice, um, before I before practice, I get in the cages. I get loose. I do some glove work before practice starts. Then we practice from anywhere from two thirty to three, from three to five. And so finish practice at five. Sa same thing. Take care of my body. I recover. Hop in the cold tub. Hop in the hot tub. Stretch. Put some compression on my legs. Just get my body prepared now for the next day, to where I can wake up the next day and be able to perform like I did today. And then we go to our team dinner. Um, it's called training table. That's what it's called. We go to training table, which is from five to eight, and then I eat around five thirty six. Go home, chill, watch TV, go to bed, and kind of wake up and do that whole thing over again seven days a week. And so for me, getting into a drinking a lot of water, eating the right food, just fuel my body to put myself in a good situation every single day and to stay healthy and fit is is huge. Yeah, it sounds like. Sounds like a taxing routine. Commitment. It's a, it's a committed. You got you to gotta commit to something. If if I miss one thing in my routine, my whole day feels a little bit feels a little bit off. Like I missed, forgot to stretch this morning. Well, that's weird. So committing to your routine every day and really do, even just doing it when you don't want to do it is kind of the biggest thing. Like I wake up some, more, some mornings and I'm like, dang, I really just don't want to get out of bed. 
for remembering like, all right, this is a grind, man. Every day is a grind. I got to get out of bed to get my feet on the ground and tackle the day. Absolutely. No, that sounds awesome. The mindset that you have as a, as a player is probably what separates you more than anything. We've talked about being a dog and all of that. But what about the mindset of you when you step into a box, right? Yeah. You're, you're ready to attack a pitch. And you mentioned it a little earlier of like, you're not going to beat me. I'm going to beat you, even if it is three out of the 10 times. But run me through that pre-pitch, that pre-at-bat routine that you got as well of how you attack a pitcher. Yeah. So my uh, routine in the box and my approach in the box starts about a day before the actual game, two days before the game. Um, we know who the starting pitcher is. You watch your film on the starting pitcher. You watch how he throws other left-handed hit- For me, I'm a left-handed hitter. So I watch how he throws other left-handed ha- hitters similar to me, what his out pitch is, what his strikeout pitch is, what his ground out pitch is, and the pitch, what the pitch is to hit for me. And so going through that routine and understanding, okay, this is how he's going to throw me, is how I then begin to attack my prep and batting cage. Uh, I attack that. Go off the slider machine. I think he's gonna throw me a couple sliders. Get the slider machine down. I think he's gonna throw a couple changeups to me. Hit up some balls off the changeup machine. And then before the game that day, um, I watch my film again. And then I come up with an approach, whatever that approach may be. Whatever it's attack the fastball, set on the curveball, whatever that is. And then when I'm on deck, I'm running through in my head. And then once I get in the box, it's all already subconsciously built into my brain. And so I know what I'm looking for. I know what his idea, what. I think he's going to do. I'm not right all the time, but I have a good idea of what I think he's going to do to me. And then I just get in the box and go from there. And then it comes into that attack the ball and drive the ball and just don't let this guy beat me. And so my routine in the box, it it builds a day before I actually face the guy. And I'm really prepping myself to get ready to face the guy. And then once they bring in a new guy, a reliever in the eighth inning, I'm on the iPad in the dugout, seeing what pitches he throws, how he's going to throw me. And then that's how I attack that guy. Do you have, um, we talk about confidence being king in the box, right? Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what you just described right there. But do you have a focal point that you focus on on the pitcher or around the field that locks you in before that at-bat or before that play? Yeah, um, I mean, you kind of got to, for me, it's really focusing on or remembering the preparation that got me to that spot. The amount of ground balls I took, the amount of reps I took, the amount of Times I hit in the batting cage, the the amount of times I hit off a live pitch or hit off a machine, and remembering what feels good, like what gets me like locked in in my zone. Like when I'm on the field, like I'll sing songs in my head to just get me like Definitely. having some swagger, you know, having some groove, having some feel. And then when I'm hitting, I remember I think just like tunnel vision, like I'm in a cage. Like mm-hmm. I think I'm in a batting cage and lock in. It's me and you here. Like it's me and you. I don't think about anything else. I don't hear anything else in the box, but it's me and you. And so remembering those extra reps you put in that is making you confident and ready to go and be in a good spot. That's what puts me in a safe place in my mind to where it's like, I'm good to go. You know, I'm confident. I'm, I'm on a fine line between confident and cockiness. You know, I'm just, I'm ready to go. Like if you beat me, I tip my cap. Good for you. It's not going to happen again. Yeah. That's yeah. That's awesome. awesome. That sounds great. Um, having that focus. And it, to me, it sounds like laser focus more than just regular focus. Um, one question I have, you know, and going back to, you know, players that maybe don't have that opportunity to, to be a division one athlete, but you know, we, we talk about Jacob and I have talked about how coaches have to, they can't miss on guys. They have to get the most out of everybody. Um, how many walk-ons does Oklahoma state usually have? And, and how many of those guys actually contribute? On, on a year to year basis, I, I mean, I don't. I'm sure you don't know previous yeah, years, but I'll, I'll give you I'll give you instance um, for last year. Shout out to Zach Earhart, who was our right fielder last year, number four right handed hitter from Tampa, Florida. Didn't have money coming out of school. Walk on out of school. Um, he comes in there, and we're like, "Who is this kid? Like, he he's short. He's five eight. Right handed hitter. Got a good arm. He's built like a Greek god. Like he's chiseled. Like he's built like a Greek. He's chiseled." Yeah. He, Super hard worker, super talented, um, fast, infielder, outfielder. Kind of didn't know what his role was going to be or if he was going to play. We start inter-squatting, and this kid couldn't get out. Like He wasn't hitting homers, but he was placing balls in good spots. Double, single, backside double, pull side double, stealing bags, stealing third, stealing home. And you're like, this kid's a baller. Like It's hard for this kid to not be in the lineup. And so we keep – we're like, all right, well, let's see if he keeps this up. And – 
He ends up starting in right field for us. After the third or fourth game of our season, ends up batting like 330 on the year. It was me and him leading off every game. If it was a right-handed pitcher, I was leading off. If it was a left-handed pitcher, he was leading off. So him and I were like the little one-two punch. And he uh, balled out for us. Walk on for Oklahoma State. And he has a phenomenal year and finishes the year. And now he's he got a scholarship after having pretty much like leading this team to what we did. Like he was like one of the foundations of our team. And so he was a walk-on. I mean, we have, we get a few, a bunch of walk-ons, a few walk-ons, guys who just like love to play, you know, and coaches respect players who love to play, who go out there and they work their tail off every single day. They have fun. They help the guys around them. They bring good energy. And so, I mean, there's always hope for another player. There's always hope for who, if you're playing baseball, like, it's never over till till you decide it's over. Like you control your career and you control what you do with it. There's been the times where you have full control over what you're doing, like you just said. But as a coach, you're constantly looking to replace the guy that's starting in that spot, right? Right. So you come in here as a freshman and you have these juniors, these seniors who are playing the position that you might want to play. Right. And you had mentioned uh, to us earlier before this that you had your buddy who was, you know, uh, playing second base at the time, and then you guys ended up flip flopping later down the line. How does somebody, besides just hard work, you know, grinding, yeah. going through the process of it, what makes them the ideal coachable kid for a coach to be like, I believe that this kid can take this spot from a junior, and I'm going to give him the shot? Right. Adjustability and adaptability, being able to adjust to your environment and adapt to what's being thrown at you. Also, being open to questions, um, being obviously respectful to your coach, taking what they're saying and applying it. If it doesn't work, then you try something else. If it works, then you get after it. Also, for me, a big thing was Houston Morrill was the shortstop. He was there for four years, one of my very, very, very good friends, and I really looked up to him a lot when I was a freshman last year. And so I would ask Houston questions every single day. Like, where are the field taking ground balls, doing off the fungos? And I'm like, hey, Houston. What do you got on this? Like, tell me something about this. Like, mm -hmm. just asking questions, asking the guys who have been there before you, have done it, and are d currently doing it. And so, being open to learning new things, whether it works or not, but being a coachable kid for me means, yes, sir, I'm gonna try it. If it works out, sweet. If it doesn't work out, coaches didn't work out for me. Let's try something else. So, being able to adapt as well, it's being able to them throw something at you and, and you try it. And then, like I said, if it working or not working and then adjusting to your environment, you know, you never know when a guy goes down and is hurt. And now it's like, Hey, like it's your time to go. You gotta be ready for that. You know, you gotta be ready to get your name called on. If someone gets sick or someone gets a fastball off the hand in the middle of a game and now he's out of the game and you you get thrown in the, you get thrown in the pit and, you're, and you gotta go fend with the wolves. And so being ready when your name is called on it, being able to adapt to that moment and adjust to, the circumstances that you're put under. Yeah, I think adjusting, especially in baseball, is is so vitally important. You know, whether it's going to Oklahoma from from California or, you know, anywhere across the country or any high school player, you know, having to deal with a new position or a new coach, you know, because so many coaches, you know, end up taking over programs or things like that. Um, if you had to give one piece of advice to to a young player, right? Whether if you were that Houston. Um, you know, in that Houston role for our, for our listeners, wh what advice would you give a young high school kid that wants to, to hopefully be a division one, division two, II, division three. Yeah. I mean, two things. The biggest one is just work your butt off every single day, man. Like whether you feeling like it, feeling like working hard or not feeling like working hard, you got to remember you're in control of your career. You know, you have to Work your tail off every single day, and then never forget why you're playing that, and that's for the love of the game. If you're playing, if you don't love the game, and you're playing it, then you shouldn't be playing it. So remember to love the game and just, just work your butt off every single day. That's awesome. Was there something from high school that you took to college, and you were like, "Holy crap, I had this all wrong," where maybe you know working hard is great and all, but you had this different perspective of what college might be for you. Yeah. What was that like? I mean, yeah, so being on the field for six hours a day opposed to being on the field for an hour a day was a huge jump. I mean, I'd, 
I didn't really know what to expect going to college. I mean, out of high school, I got drafted out of high school, 11th round by the Brewers. So I'm expecting like, all right, maybe I'm going to go play professional baseball and jump into the fire with the professional guys. I choose to go to college, get there for first practice, and we practice for three or four hours. And our coach is like, all right, like, this is your light day. I'm like, whoa, light day? We just did four hours of practicing. I've never done some of this stuff. And so for me was – adjusting to my environment and realizing that man college college baseball like we practice eight hours a day seven times a week like there's no downtime and there is no time to go mess around with the boys and do stuff they're not supposed to be doing like you have to grind every single day and so going from high school to college was that big step into your life is baseball I mean you're a student athlete you do what you do in the classroom to get you on the field and keep you on the field but once you're there and you're on the field, you have to be locked in. You have to be focused on baseball. You can't be worrying about social media or the things or that girl you met the other night. Like, you got to be worried about what's going on in front of you. And for me, I like to tell people, just be present in the moment. Like, wherever you're at, like us right now, hanging out, doing this podcast, having a good time, like, just be present, you know? Just enjoy where you're at and what you're doing. And so that was that was huge for me going to college. Yeah, that's awesome. Um You've 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 been fortunate enough to to have some incredible coaches, right? I mean, you had Jack Wilson as a coach at, at TO, um, you know, who's now over at, at Grand Canyon University. You've you obviously have Matt Holiday, um, Robin Ventura. Um, what do you see from those guys or hear from those guys that you know you take little bits of and you're like, man, this is only going to make me better. Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest things I can accumulate from all my coaches that I've learned is that even the best players fail. You know, you have the best players ever, like, have a bad year, have a bad at-bat. Remembering, like, that this game we're playing is hard, and it's one of the hardest games out there. You know, it's not going to be easy. It's never going to be easy. So learning how to overcome failure, and I like to say learn how to be a professional failure. Like, the professional guys who are batting 300 are 3 for 10. You know, if, if you're a wide receiver in football and you only catch three of the ten balls, you're not playing. You know, if, if you're three for ten from the free point line, like, you're not going to be shooting the ball a lot. And so for baseball, it's learning how to be a failure. I mean, it sounds rough and it sounds hard, but, like, that's what it is. Like, learning how to overcome a bad game or learning how to overcome a day where you strike out four times and also not getting too high or too low, like – for me, I like to play. The way I like to play is act like I just went four for four with four home runs every single day. You know, you don't want to be at a point to where you have a great game and you think, oh, like I'm the man now. And then next day you have a bad game. You're like, oh, like I shouldn't be playing. Like I suck. And so don't be too high. Don't be too low. Just be the same person every single day. And then learn how to overcome those failures when they present themselves. Don't yeah. plateau. Don't plateau. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's your confidence. Yeah. Is there anything else that you would think uh, a high schooler that may be thinking of going to college, depending on the division or conference that they're in, what's some advice just overall that you would give to them at this moment? Yeah, I mean, just work hard and love the game. I mean, that, that's what it is. I mean, I've always told my pops, like, no matter where I am in life, if I'm in 10-year big leaguer and I just for some reason wake up and, like, don't love the game anymore, that's when I'm hanging it up. You know, that's when I'm just hanging the cleats up and I'm done playing. And so don't take it for granted because – We'll be 30 years old, 35 years old, and the game's over. Like, what are you going to do with your life there? And so, I mean, one of the big things that I try to implement and remind myself is when I'm in college, I want people to remember me as a good teammate, as a good person. I don't want to be remembered as the dude who hit a home run against OU or the dude who did this, the dude who did that. I want to be remembered as the guy who was there for my boys when they needed them, the guy who said what's up to – to a boy when he walks past me. Like, I want to be remembered as a guy that people can call in the near future and say, hey, man, I need you. Can you help me out? And I'm there for them. And so, I mean, being a good person, being a good teammate, remembering the game is not going to be here forever. I mean, it'll always be there, but it don't wait for you. It's not going to hold up for you. Like, baseball will always be there, but you won't always be playing it. And so just have fun with it. I mean, work hard, love what you're doing, and get after it. Be a dog. I love it. I love it. I love it. It's, 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 it's awesome. And I mean, I think you talk about being a good teammate, being somebody that, you know, people can rely on. Um, 
you are the most polarizing college baseball player, according to to many. How does that feel? It doesn't feel any different than I did the day before I did what I did. You know, I mean, I wake up and I'm the same guy every day. Like, I love this game. I love what I'm doing. I'm going to continue doing that. Whether it inspires someone or hurts their feelings, like, I hate to say it, I'm not changing. You know, I mean, I'm going to make the people proud. The people who believe in me, I'm going to make them proud. If you don't like me, you got to have to deal with it. And so that's kind of like how I play. Like, you guys are my close friends. You know, you guys are great people. and I know you guys are rooting for me. And I always have your back. You always have my back. And it's all that matters is that small group of people that, you know, has got your back and that will do anything for you. You'll do anything for them. I love it. Last question. When uh, Oklahoma State makes it to Omaha this year. Oh, yeah. I think Jake and I are flying out. We're going we're gonna to do part two of this podcast. I'm leaving you guys tickets. Let's go. You just call my number. Absolutely. You got my number. Let's do it. Let's do it. Sure. Go Pokes, Absolutely. baby. Go Pokes. Let's ride. Absolutely. Let's ride. Anything you want to say to any fans out there listening or or – Wanda, you know, anything you, you do that, that they can, you know, follow or, or anything like that? Any uh, Rock Regio on, on Instagram? Yeah, I mean, uh, just stay the course. When things get tough, you stay the course. When things are going good, stay the course because everything will put you in, in a good spot in life. So stay the course, have fun, lo- love what you do. Rock, thank you so much for being on this podcast. Truly appreciate it. I think you're going to help a lot of players that, you know, want to get to that level. And, um, I'm so excited to watch it. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Let's get after it. Absolutely. Thank you again for being on it. Jacob, anything? That's all I got, brother. Yeah. Thank you again for tuning into this podcast. We got Rock Reggio over here. Going to tear it up this year. It's going to be an amazing year. Yeah. Go Pokes, baby. Uh, Rock Reggio here um, with the Baseball Playground. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, all the platforms. The Baseball Playground. Here we come.